Okay, hello everybody, I'm really happy to be here. I'm very grateful to be in Budapest again after several years and to collaborate with Chandler and with Attila and with the wonderful crew of the K-Monitor. We met in Sarajevo around 10 years ago, I believe, and then we started collaborating on several projects, educational projects, workshops, hackathons, practical data visualizations that I've built for K-Monitor and now uh, now we are organizing this workshop about data storytelling and data art, uh, especially tailored for young uh, journalists and storytellers and activists and people interested in the connections between design and technology and society. And basically this is what I'm also interested in. I'm a digital artist and writer and educator with a background in software engineering. I've studied at the University of Belgrade. And uh, later I worked in Canada at the Faculty of Interactive Arts and Technology in Vancouver. Returned to Belgrade, uh, finished my PhD, also co-wrote one travel novel and uh, had several exhibitions. And now I work at, uh, at uh, two schools in, in Serbia, two universities teaching digital art and data visualization and uh, algorithmic culture and stuff like this. So this is like a short background of who I am and what I do. I'm currently based in Belgrade, but I also travel around and uh, you can contact me if you have any, any questions outside of the scope of this particular workshop. Uh, this is the triangle of, of what I do and what covers what I do. I try to connect art and design with, with writing and uh, uh, with, uh, with technology. And I'm going to start with a quote. By, by the German uh, poet Hans Magnus Hansensberger. It says, don't read odes, my boy, read the timetables, they are more exact. And this connection between the odes, between poetry, between aesthetics, between art on one hand, and the, the data, the empirical, the scientific, the mathematical will be something that goes through the entire workshop and through the entire lecture. Like how to connect these and how to talk about the actual empirical phenomena we can measure, such as, I don't know, the urban environment or the, I don't know, data related to unemployment or the housing unavailability, stuff like that. How to take the mathematics of it and the empirical part of it and then transfer it into visual stories, into something that's engaging, something that's both informative and emotionally engaging. So, yes, I'm going to start with a chart that was one of the most influential charts in my life. I discovered it when I was in my early puberty. It was my mother's book, published in Yugoslavia in the in 60s. It was called Love and Sex. It was part of the female empowerment, feminist, Yugoslav movements. When uh, finally women were starting to talk about orgasms in public and it became something that was relatively, let's say, open and progressive and books like this were published and uh, they talk about the heart rate in a second for female and male orgasm. Now, I mean, I don't want to go into the gender thing about it all, but what's really, you know, struck me, I was a kid, I was something that was the, the, the middle of my elementary school, I was really fascinated with this diagram and being, you know, like a young artsy nerd. I was completely fascinated with the shape of this diagram and with the dotted line and like why is this a dotted line and why the female one is a little bit more intense and what does it mean with the shape of it. You can imagine what this thing did to my imagination when I was a kid. And then I, I went to, to, the, to the secondary school, high school, uh, gymnasium we call it in Serbo-Croatian and uh, I discovered this. This is the classic Aristotelian story structure, like the classic plot structure that every story has, like the climax of the story. First you have the introduction, you have an area of events, you have the climax of the story and then you have the resolution of the story and from the story of Gilgamesh in Mesopotamia all the way to Marvel blockbuster as you can see that the entire history of storytelling somehow follows this exact same story. If some of you came from the background of dramatic arts, you can also find it among different writers. It's called by different names. Also in music you can find it. This is the average chart of the most popular folk song, uh, pop songs uh, for the last couple of decades. And this is another chart that also 
shows the most popular songs. So if you look at these charts, these are, well, practically exactly the same charts, and, and the way we experience temporal art and experience storytelling art is something that's very, very deeply rooted in our, you know, psychology, our biology, our humanness, whatever you want to call it, and understanding it at charting it, charting these patterns, uh, patterns of both subjectivity and objectivity is something data art does and, and data storytelling can do. Yeah, so uh, my first question would be for you, what is data visualization? And I don't want any kind of academic definitions, I want you to tell me in your own words what do you think it is and why is it a new thing? Is it really a new thing? How would you describe it? I guess it's conveying your message in a way. Okay, good. Conveying your message. What else? Conveying your message to a larger audience, making it easier to to get the message. Okay, but we can do that with a film. We can do that with a classic story, short story, or a journalistic story. We can do it with a visual piece. What does? Uh, what makes data visualization different from other mediums of communication and conveying messages? It drastically uh, content, condenses uh, complex information. Yes, it condenses complex information. I like that. But what is the data part in it? <laughs> it's based on the real world, usually. Like, you know, you get your the data parts from the real world, basically, not from just from the imagination as in like movies or right? Exactly. This is a really good comment. So what you really have as the basis of your media piece is uh, some sort of empirical research thing, a table, a data table, most often it's a CSV file or a table in Excel, Google spreadsheets, whatever, collection of tables, SQL database, whatever. So you've measured something in the reality around you, you've collected some information, could be numerical information, usually it's a numerical set of, set of numerical information, but it can also be some other types of hierarchical structural information. So this kind of data and information, then you have a job to transfer it to a media piece, something that actually communicates that to, to, a, wider, to a wider public. So data visualization uh, can be seen as a form of infographics, where infographics is a little bit more focused on, uh, on information, while data visualization is a little more technical, connected with numerical data, but I don't want to go into this, you know, uh, into this academic distinctions. In many ways it comes from the history of cartography, history of map making, and uh, the only difference is that today we have computers and we have these uh, complex algorithms and really well-developed tools for making these maps, but it's really a craft and an art form old as, you know, uh, mediums themselves. Some of the oldest drawings, the cave drawings from the Paleolithic times were actually star charts or geographic maps. And when you go all the way back in history, you can see that data visualization is as old as art and literature itself. So it's nothing really new. What is new is that today we have computers. We can use these computers to make new forms of maps, and these maps don't need to be maps where the coordinate system is I don't know, latitude and longitude, and then you have a geographic map or a star map. You can make a map of the economy. You can make a map of you know, public moods. You can make a map of urban settlements. You can make a map of inflation. You can make a map of, I don't know, uh, uh, where do Nazi groups organize whatever you want to chart, but you can make these maps. And you can use digital tools for creating these things. So in a nutshell, this is what data visualization is. You have the world with all its complexity and continuity on, on the left, and then you measure something from that world and you transfer it into, into a data table and then you chart it. So data visualization, in a nutshell, could be a chart, could be a graph, could be a map, could be something that is based on data, but when it's really effective as a medium, as a form of communication, it means that we have used this chart not only as this boring, simple chart, but it's also something like a media piece that can grasp and that can make people really, you know, get interested into a topic. 
and it can be very complex, but it doesn't have to be complex. And uh, some of the pieces that I've created were actually really simple. Now I'm going to show you one that I've created in less than five minutes, almost by accident. I come from the city of Panchevo. The city of Panchevo is really close to Belgrade. It's practically part of Belgrade, but it's also part of Vojvodina. It's the northern part of Serbia, which also has a strong Hungarian cultural roots. So it's a combination of Serbian and mm -hmm. Hungarian and Yugoslav culture. Uh, and it's also, it was one of the biggest industrial centers in Yugoslavia because of the industry, because of other things. It's also uh, infamous for pollution and, uh, you know, all these ecological struggles were part of me growing up in Panchevo. Uh, and usually one of the arguments was that Panchevo has its own ecological problems. Panchevo is the, is the, is the you know, city that is polluted, but Belgrade is super clean. And you know the upper classes of Belgrade, they can always talk about pollution and about ecological disaster as something that is a punch of a problem and not a Belgrade problem. So I've drawn this map. This here is Belgrade. Pancho is over there above the Danube. And uh, over there you have the source of the, of the pollution. This big uh, complex of factories, refineries, oil refineries, uh, Mm, other, other kinds of factories, and then I just, you know, drew with hand on a vacuum tablet, I drew these lines to show how far these, uh, this complex is from the center of Panchevo, is 7.5 kilometers away from, from, the, from Panchevo, from the center of Panchevo, and it's, I don't know, 10 kilometers or 17 kilometers away from the center of Belgrade, and then I drew this uh, green line, and then I said, that green uh, line is a magical wall that protects Belgrade from the pollution of the Pancho factory complex. And then I published it online, and then I didn't even mean to publish it as something that's like, I know, activistic or an art piece. I mean, it's ugly as fuck, because it was really drawn, it was just, you know, like a joke I wanted to to publish, but then it became extremely viral, extremely fast, and thousands of people started sharing this image, and it became really communicative, and actually some, you know, uh, organizations started using it to, to, to try to raise awareness in Belgrade about the problems of pollution, and so on, and so on. And the point is that you really can create engaging database without any serious uh, design, uh, let's say, literacy, or any serious technological uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, knowledge, technological skills, technological knowledge. This is the data set I've used. I measured it all practically by hand, drew this by hand. I intentionally made it ugly because it was meant as a joke. And I drew these two little uh, stick figures. One is sad, the other is happy. It's really extremely simple, but it somehow grasped the collective imagination and it became viral. And I think to this day, this is one of the most popular and viral data these pieces I've made, even though it's so amateurish and not in any way serious. Uh, and it violates some of the best practices in data visualization. So I wanted to start with this. You can really play around, you can really be creative and uh, as long as you're honest and you're humorous and you're direct and you want to communicate what, what, what is the real problem of, of your, your environment, there is a way to find audience for it and I think that people somehow intuitively sense when you have an agenda and when you're just honestly, you know, uh, worried about some kind of social problem that is also affecting you personally. And this was the case, as it is a database piece that is extremely easy to make without any kind of design or technological knowledge. Uh, and uh, several years later, we got apps like this, uh, mobile apps that can actually show the, the pollution. It turned out that actually pollution in Belgrade is a little bit bigger than the pollution in Pancho. And uh, uh, people started talking about these things. So this pollution problem is decades old. Uh, 15 years ago, it was uh, as huge as it is now. But when did people start talking about these things? They started talking about these things when these things became visible. So this is a really, really important point. How to make complex systems, systemic forces, structural forces that are invisible, how to make them visible? How to make invisible visible? And pollution, although it sometimes 
smells bad and you don't feel nice to be in a polluted setting, although you have that kind of aesthetic quality, more often than not, what pollutes you the most is not the thing that is smelly, it's the thing that doesn't smell at all, but it's somehow toxic to you, and then you just need to make it visible, because people don't know it exists. If they cannot, you know, grasp it with their five senses, they don't know it exists. And it's completely invisible to them, and in this sense, when we got these apps, these apps were free, everybody could download them, they could follow what happens around the city, they are relatively simple to build. I think this is open street maps with just uh, simple pins, and then you have different colors, and then you have an API that brings data, uh, I don't know, each hour or each couple of hours, and then it changes this kind of, of uh, visual landscape. You have an array of sensors around the city, so it's not that complicated to make. People started seeing these things, and then they started talking about these things that became visible to them. So, yeah, how to look at complex systems? This is the question, how to make them visible and noticeable. I say complex systems, it may sound abstract, but in a practical sense, a complex system is, I don't know, the ecology of a city, pollution situation in a city, but we can also talk about inflation, we can talk about housing crisis, we can talk about the accumulation of capital, we can talk about uh, natural systems, you know, like the pandemic, what happens with the pandemic, how to stop it, how to deal with it. We can talk about uh, different kinds of, uh, uh, you know, natural climate uh, related uh, issues, things that are going on, floods. Any kind of complex system can be presented in this way. Uh, what is also important is that it requires collaboration and in my, uh, my practice, and I gave I think 50, maybe 100 of, of workshops like this, the best uh, combination is when in a group like this, in a workshop like this, you have people from, from diverse backgrounds, you have people from the technological background, you have people from art and design background, you have people from literature or, uh, I don't know, activistic or political background, and then they can work together and they can exchange not only skills, but also mindsets and viewpoints, because somebody that comes from an engineering background is going to look at things from a different perspective than somebody who comes from either sociology or somebody who comes from the design background. So the ideal thing is to have all of these things in your group and to approach these things not only transdisciplinary, I would be more radical than that, I would say anti-disciplinary, so not to talk about these disciplines, but actually to talk about the topic. The topic is I know problem of water supplies in one Hungarian Arno village, and then from all the sides you can approach this problem of the, of the water supplies. You can see the technological part of it, how to present it, how to tell a story about it, how to show the personal side of it, the subjective side, the objective side, what the people who live there think about that, how costly would it be to repair, uh, who would give the money, and then you can, you know, holistically approach the problem that you're dealing with. What kind of problem uh, doesn't matter, but you need to somehow approach it not disciplinary, but holistically with different kinds of approaches. Another system, this is a solar system, this is a data visualization or an infographics that represent our solar system. One of these illustrations uh, I had also in my elementary school. You can imagine it was much less exciting to me than the one with the female orgasm. But uh, yeah, this was also an exciting thing. And uh, later I've actually discovered that this picture is wrong. When I was a kid, I, I really saw it literally, that you have these balls, you know, running around, uh, swirling around, but actually it turned out that this picture is wrong, and I want to ask you, what is the main, uh, main problem with this picture? Scale and size. Yes, scale and size. And what does it mean? It means that if we want to have the sun that is this size and we want the other planets to be up to scale, then these planets would have to be much, much smaller, smaller than one pixel. They would not even be visible in a resolution like this. And the Mercury would probably be, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, 10, 10, 20, 30 meters away in the street over there. So you wouldn't be able to see Mercury, not to speak about Venus and Earth and Mars and all the other planets in a solar system. So the scale is a problem. 
and uh, the scale is, uh, of course, this is okay because it's meant for kids and for the imagination of kids so they can e even imagine what is a solar system. But as kids grow older, it's a problem because they need to understand that the solar system is actually vastly empty. And when you go from the sun towards Mercury, you have nothing, nothing, a little bit more of nothing, then more of nothing, nothing, vacuum, a lot of vacuum. And then after all this vacuum, you have this tiny little Mercury, and then again, you have this vacuum of nothing. And then comes Venus and Earth and, and the rest. And now I'm playing with rhetorical figures, and these rhetorical figures are also a way of data visual, uh, visualization in the sense that I'm trying to use storytelling techniques to convey the vastness of emptiness between the Sun and Mercury as the first planet in the solar system. So there were different ways to visualize this, and one of the more successful ones is in Sweden, in uh, 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 in Stockholm, so this is Stockholm, this is the map of Stockholm, and this is the building, I think it is a building owned by Ericsson or some big uh, Swedish company, it doesn't really matter, but uh, somebody had an idea to take this big, large, round building as a model for the sun, so if we say that this is the sun and we want to keep all the other planets up to scale, how big would they be and where would we position them? And then they've created all the other planets, and not only planets, but also other objects, like lar large asteroids and kuiperoids, uh, you know, other objects in the solar system that are further away from the Neptune and, and the Pluto, and then all the way up you have the terminal shock, like where the, the Sun's gravity sort of ends. Uh, so you can uh, walk around Stockholm, and you can drive around the entire country of Sweden, and somehow grasp the vastness of space and the vastness of empty space that is between, you know, the sun and other planets and other objects. If this is the sun, this ball would be Mercury, this sphere would be Mercury, and then you would go all the way to the end of Sweden in order to, to somehow, uh, on a subjective level, feel what does it mean to, to traverse this, this kind of empty space. I think we also have it in Hungary in Kecskemét. I think that the sun is inside the, the city house. In yes. Kecskemét, you have to go up in the suburbs. In Zagreb, in Croatia, you yeah. also have a similar, similar model. And uh, uh, in Belgrade, uh, they wanted to build something 10 years ago, and I'm going to talk about that right now. This is Douglas Adams' quote about infinity that inspired me for this description. And this is the Belgrade model. So we have the Sweden the Swedish model, the Ketchkemet one, the Zagreb one, this is the Belgrade one. And the Belgrade one has one peculiar thing about it that makes it better. Uh, but it was never built, so I don't have any right to, to you know, say it's, it's better because it doesn't exist. This was just a model. Uh, that was created by, by a group of architects and artists and scientists and astrophysicists. The idea was to put the sun in the, in the center at the confluence of the Danube and Sava rivers and then to put these tiny little planets all around and to position them, for example, the, ne uh, the, the, um, the Uranus was, was uh, positioned at the, at the Nikola Tesla airport and uh, Neptune was positioned in Banchevo in front of the old Escafana in Banchevo that was uh, called Neptune for some reason. <laughs> so they found really, really interesting uh, ways to, to, to put these, uh, these planets on a map. The sun would be at the confluence, it would be five meters wide, all these other planets would be small as marbles and you can put them on postaments and it was actually not that even expensive to build, but uh, it was not built because of political idiocy uh, and short-sightedness. I don't have really another theory for that. Uh, but uh, what makes it special is that if you would go from the sun, and the sun is here, and you would walk towards the Earth, and the Earth would be somewhere here between New Belgrade and Zemun, uh, it would take you around eight and a half minutes to reach Earth. If you walk uh, five kilometers per hour, which is the average uh, speed of, of humans walking, when humans walk, they by one hour 
on average they they uh, pass one kilometer and so you would it would take you one eight and a half minutes to reach the earth the, the earth from the sun and why is it an interesting number that's the light the time that the sunlight reaches it. Exactly. So, so you will travel at light speed. Exactly. You will travel at light speed. And if, if you're a nerd like me, this is exhilarating. This is so exciting. This makes this model so really, really exciting because not only you have planets up to scale and you not only have distances between planets up to scale and sizes up to scale, you also have the speed of light up to the scale of your average walking speed and that is so you know amazingly nerdy and beautiful and aesthetically just fantastic and now I are mean, even more sad that we haven't built it yet maybe we can do some kind of a guerrilla thing because this can be built by paper or something cheap we can even 3d print this thing if they want to you know destroy it a couple of days later what the fuck let them destroy it, but we would have the thing. So, so why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because this is a really beautiful example of a data sculpture, of a data art piece, of a data visualization that's not only uh, up to scale, that's not only uh, completely empirical in a sense that it follows data, it follows mathematics, it doesn't lie, uh, it's also really emotionally engaging. It's also a very good story. It's also something that has a good UX design, usability. It's also something that's an experience in itself. It would make people come to Belgrade just to feel, you know, what does it mean to go from the Earth to Jupiter or from the Earth to Sun and then to imagine the speed of light in comparison to the sizes of these things. So it could make this really, really complex system uh, that is a solar system, something that's comprehensible, something that is uh, something we can actually imagine, something that we can experience with our sweat and with our bodies and with our minds and with our feet, and something that uh, becomes uh, tangible, something that's not abstract anymore, that's not something that's only in the realm of abstract ideas and abstract math, something that becomes part of the, you know, the aesthetics of life. Uh, of our sensory apparatus of something that, that we can actually feel. Uh, so yeah, we can visualize natural systems, we can visualize social systems, that is power relations. And uh, now another example, this is Miladin Kovacevic. He is uh, this Serbian exchange student who was 10 years ago in the United States. And he was also uh, interested in basketball. Sometimes they present him as a basketball player, but he was an amateur player. He was not any kind of a professional basketball player. Uh, and over there, he uh, started studying whatever, and he was uh, from an influential family in Serbia, and he went into a bar fight with a guy who is from an influential uh, American family, and then uh, they got into a bar fight, and this guy broke uh, I don't know what of, of, of this American guy, but it was a really nasty fight and the other guy ended up in a hospital. I think that uh, there's some kind of, um, I don't know, is he still alive or is he in a wheelchair or something like that, but it was a really nasty fight. And then what happened, he came back to the Serbian embassy and because he has uh, connections in the Serbian ruling class, they gave him uh, a false uh, passport and with his false passport he managed to escape the United States and travel to Serbia and when he was in Serbia of course because the other guy was uh, close to the American ruling class it became a political problem between two countries which made it really really stupid and there are millions of people in the States and in the Balkans somehow becoming victims of these two idiots who had a bar fight uh, you know this drunk spoiled the brats uh, and then, uh, of course, the United States demanded the, the extradition, that's the right word, right, extradition. Uh, but then uh, these politicians in Serbia, they said, yeah, but this is against the law, against the constitution, we are not allowed to do that, we, we cannot change this law, we cannot change the constitution because it's too complicated. So they made a settlement, they made a deal, the American part was also ready to make a deal, and the deal was 1 million euros. 
uh, that was given from the Serbian official public budget for this guy not to be in court, but to stay in Serbia. The Americans with their lobby groups were completely fine with it. They took the money. These guys gave the money. So I was, let's say that I gave one euro for the life of this beautiful human being. Uh, okay, so uh, this is what was like the media information. So at the end, I just wanted to be completely clear. I don't know anything from the first person. I don't know these people. This is something that was like investigative journalism and the information I'm sharing with you right now is something that as far as I can tell seems plausible to me, but uh, I must at the end, you know, be, be completely, uh, how do you say, uh, want to make sure that there is a chance that this is not true. But this is what was presented to us. So the bottom line is we gave 1 million euros because uh, it was too compli complicated to change the law or the constitution and then you had an array of politicians going out and saying yes, but the million, million euros, it may seem a lot to you personally, but for a country a million euros is nothing if you really want to protect our cities. And then I started thinking, okay, so a million euros is nothing, what does it really mean? What, what, what is a million euros? How, how, how do you imagine million euros? And for me, I realized that a million euros is, uh, on a personal level, on this you know, bodily level, when I don't go into mathematical abstractions, what does million euros mean? It means a really lot of money that I'm never going to have in my life. Probably never going to have in my life. Uh, so uh, it's almost the same as billion euros. So a billion is 100, uh, 1,000 times more than a million, but for me, as this regular citizen, uh, a billion euros and a million euros is exactly the same. Just a lot of money that I'm never ever going to see. It's completely impossible for me to imagine that. It's just an abstract figure that could exist in a bank or could exist, I don't know, in some other form. But I, I could not actually feel what a million euros is. So when a politician mentions million euros, it may seem as something that's an, an empirical fact, it's really rational, it's really secular, it's really, you know, something that's part of the rational discourse of adults. But when people listen to that, what they actually hear is a lot of money I know nothing of, I'm never going to own that, I'm never going to see that. So it's completely beyond my imagination. What does million euros actually mean? Uh, and so I started uh, doing this uh, research, what, what, uh, how does million euros look like? And then uh, this was created, uh, I don't know, six, seven years ago, with the inflation now, you know, a million euros is like uh, 10 million euros or something. But back then, uh, I tried to find what a fair haul, uh, how, how much uh, would a fair haul cost, how much a public school would cost, and how much a cardiovascular clinic would cost, so something that is like a publicly relevant investment. And one fair hall in, in the city of Zrenjanin uh, or in the city of Bečkerek, that's close to Pančevo, it's uh, one half, uh, a half million euros, one school uh, with, a, uh, with a sports hall would be four million euros and one cardiovascular clinic would be almost 30 million euros. So now, with these proportions, I could actually have some sort of an actual human-centric sense of what does a million euros look like. And then I decided to invent a new unit, a new physical unit, not to express it in euros, or to use meters, or to use some other like physical quantities. I invented miladin as the new, the new <laughs> unit. So instead of one mil, a million euros, you have one mil miladins, and this is a miladin, and because of his really, you know, stature and everything, <laughs> it was not hard to design this pixel art 8-bit character. You can even imagine a video game where you collect these miladins, or uh, you control this miladin guy. And then uh, a city hall in Zrenjanin would be a half of miladin but you need to, to cut him laterally, because otherwise you wouldn't know where the exact half is, but that, that does not be really important. <laughs> One school with a sports hall with four miladins and a clinic for cardiovascular illnesses would be 29 miladins, almost 30 miladins, so more than two uh, football teams of miladins, Kovacevic's. 
beautiful. So yeah, and, and this example was really, uh, let's say every time I talk about this example, people smile and you are smiling and they somehow engaging and uh, then uh, one, of the, one of the organizations in Serbia that deal with corruption uh, consulta uh, had, a, had a consultation with me and together we made uh, an idea that uh, we can express this investment project in other investment projects. So how many schools could be put in a, I don't know, a highway between Serbia and Montenegro and Kosovo. So you can actually express different investment projects in smaller, in, in terms of smaller investment projects. And these even smaller investment projects you can express in terms of even smaller investment projects so you can build with pixelated charts where you can uh, actually get a sense, get a grip, get a real, you know, human grip, how, how much do these things actually cost. So you start with something that's really playful and humorous and something that can engage people's imagination, people's sense of ethics and fairness. And then uh, with this kind of playful, artsy language, you can actually be really uh, thorough and scientific in terms of following the exact data and uh, following the exact empirical procedures and methodologies that you're dealing with. Yeah. Another example of data visualization is, uh, of course, the visualization of social media, visualization of different uh, social graphs. One of the most uh, well-known uh, uh, way to visualize these social graphs uh, is to, you know, put people as, as nodes and then as um, connections between the nodes, you somehow connect who is connected to whom. And what really struck me is uh, that was actually uh, a methodology developed by different, you know, police and military organizations back in the back in the history. And concretely, Hannah Arendt in *The Origins of Totalitarianism* in 1951 talks about uh, the uh, talks about the methodology invented by by Russian uh, uh, secret police uh, before the Soviet Union. So this was the end of the 19th century. And they had a filling system in which every suspect was noted on a large card in the center with his name was surrounded by a red circle. His political friends were designated by smaller red circles. Non-political would be green circles. Brown circles would be uh, persons in contact with friends of the suspect but not known to him personally. And so on and so on. And obviously the limitations of this method are set only by the size of the filling cards and theoretically a gigantic single sheet who show the relations and cross relationships of the entire population. And this is the utopian goal of the totalitarian secret police, a look at the gigantic map of the office wall would suffice at any given moment to establish not who is who or who thinks what, but who is related to whom and in what degree or kind of intimacy. So this description really struck me and amazed me because basically this is every Facebook or Instagram or TikTok visualization, every social graph that we have today that looks exactly the same as what Hannah Arendt described in 1951. What do we like? What do we do on the internet? How do we behave? So we get at this completely new political landscape today that's being, you know, algorithmic, uh, algorithmically mediated, digitally mediated. Uh, we are able to, you know, use this data, but also large corporations, uh, empires use this kind of data to, to monitor us. And the one huge part of the Let's say social aspect of data visualization is how to. Just, just a second, you will get a mic to um, have a bit more sound. Oh, of course. And that's it. Hello. Is it better? Is it better? Do you do you hear me back in the back in the other room? Great. So yeah, uh, this is something that we have today. It's completely regular, and the question is how we as citizens, how we as people who are these, you know, small little dots, small little nodes within these huge social systems, how we can self-organize and try to utilize this kind of languages and this kind of tools for you know our interests and not only for the interests of these big players. And in this sense, this is really similar to the history of cartography. Because cartography as a connection between art and science was always something that's 
uh, completely. Uh, you cannot talk about the history of cartography and not talk about the history of you know imperialism, colonialism, geographical explorations, control of resources, accumulation of, of resources all around the world. So you always have this dark side of cartography. On the one hand, data visualization makes things clear, but also the data visualization is something that's also more available to people in the positions of power than uh, something that is available to the powerless. So the question is how to make the language of cartography, how to make data visualization also available to powerless. And uh, as far as I've seen, you know, some, some of you, some of the participants' CV that came here, is something that's also interesting to you. The, so this is why I wanted to open this topic. So yes, we can visualize social systems, we can visualize natural systems, but also we want to visualize the systems in a way that is, uh, that is uh, clear and informative to, to people who are without power, not only to help people who are in power. So this is a small social graph, you have a huge social graph, and now with this amount of data and with everything we do on the internet, you can imagine one huge 8 billion not large filling card that can cover almost anybody on the planet because now like the large majority of people on the planet use the internet and use some kind of social media, be it TikTok or Twitter or Amazon or whatever. And uh, yeah, the question is how can we utilize these tools uh, to, to you know, help people around us. So data visualization can also be dangerous just as cartography can be dangerous. But it can be also a really good thing. This is an example of an activist visualization created by Dr. John Snow in London in the mid 19th century. He doesn't have anything to do with Game of Thrones. So the, the name John Snow is just a coincidence. His name was John Snow. He was a medical doctor. He was researching cholera and the spread of cholera in, uh, in London. And back then you had all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories about cholera, it's bad spirits in some kind of, you know, evil Chinese who came to spread the cholera, or you have uh, some kind of crocodiles underwater who, who are there, and so on, and so on, and so on. But it turns out that it was, uh, you know, a, a, I think a bacterial thing. So he, being a medical doctor, actually explained the mechanism of how does it work. And this map, he also drew because he wanted to show that it's connected with the pollution of water and you have a water that's being polluted by cholera and uh, if we redraw the map in color we can see what does it show. It shows you households where one or more people died from cholera and uh, also you can see the water pumps and the water pump in the middle, this blue water pump here was the ones that was infected by cholera and the other ones were not. So it shows correlation between different data points. And this correlation doesn't imply causation. And I'm going to repeat that. Correlation doesn't imply causation because people around the cholera infected water pump have died out of cholera more than the other people around. Doesn't necessarily mean that the cholera is the case of their death. But together with this chart, he also, uh, you know, had an entire theory of why does it happen. So he had uh, different scientific uh, uh, scientific information that actually say that there is not only correlation, but there's also causation. And this uh, chart, as far as I know, was instrumental in making the politicians of London actually close the. Uh, close the water pipe in the mid-19th century and actually stop the epidemic. So you have an example in the 19th century of advocates, activists, scientists and designers using the data visualization as a practical tool to actually change something about their societies. So I, I view this as a really positive example and uh, somehow I think that if it, if it was possible in the 19th century it should be possible in the 21st century. Of course, it's much easier to you know, close one water pipe than to you know, uh, stop uh, real estate corruption projects all around the city, but uh, nevertheless, it's still uh, a very good way to, to, to illustrate how a data visualization can be a powerful uh, advocacy tool and a powerful communication tool.
especially if you have a situation where people are actually dying and this dying continues and people want a solution to a really uh, serious problem of their neighborhood. Uh, these are some contemporary visualization showing the Arctic, Arctic ice from 1980s all the way to the 90s, 2000s, we see the disappearing of Arctic ice. So these are now the visualizations that you also can make. This is a simple GIF, and this GIF is uh, like an animation you can share on social media, and it shows, uh, shows the, the scale of the climate change we are experiencing. Another climate-related chart uh, where you can see the discrepancy between countries that are actually influencing uh, climate change on the right, being all these big countries such as the United States and China and Russia and Japan and Germany and uh, South Korea and the United Kingdom. And on the left are the countries, the most vulnerable ones, the ones most affected by climate change, most African countries, Sudan, Eritrea, Chad, Congo, Burundi, Haiti also, and so on. And uh, the, 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 the more the bluish the country is, the more blue the country is, the more vulnerable to cl climate change is, the, the more red it is, the more it actually influences climate change. This is another climate-related visualization uh, where you can see this same thing, just shown in another way, shown as a scatter plot. Scatter plot is a way to plot data in a uh, in a in a coordinate system, and uh, down there you can see the change of population, and up here you can say see the climate change vulnerability index. So uh, you can see that uh, vulnerable um, uh, what's the the extreme risk of climate change is mostly seen where the where there is a huge change in, in population and that is in Africa. The red one is in Africa. The the orange one is Asia, the blue and uh, the blue ones are, are the Western countries, Americans and Europe. This is an animated tree map. So now we are also going through the vocabulary of data visualization. You have geographical maps, you have scatter plots, you have tree maps. This is a, a very common way to represent budget, something that we did together, K-Monitor and me a couple of years ago, used this same language of, of different you know, sizes within a one uh, rectangle to, to show different parts of the budget. And now we are showing carbon emissions instead of, instead of budgets. Another one that's also kind of visually uh, engaging is a map of temperature anomalies like popping out like this kind of almost like some kind of evil fireworks. Uh, I don't want to use another metaphor, but we can, we can stick with fireworks uh, and we can see how these anomalies are, are growing by, by the year. This is a combination of web design and data visualization, also talking about uh, uh, also talking about uh, I'm not sure. I think this is this is also something related to the climate, and you can see different. Uh, uh, different uh, charts, different ways of rep representing it that would also be a practical uh, practical advice to always use different charts, different views, not only to create one view but to create a collection of views and to combine text with visuals in order to tell a story. So if there are among you people who are into web design, uh, this one pager is a good example how you can tell through one page in combination with text and charts, a story about, uh, about the effects of, of climate change. This is a minimal chart created by Ed Hawkins. He's a data scientist, also a data artist, 
So he was uh, visualizing global temperatures and everything we talked before, with these charts before, he managed to do in one single chart that is so simple, you can actually you know, draw it by hand in Photoshop or even Microsoft Paint. You can create a chart like this. You can just take a year. So each line, each vertical line is one year, all the way from the beginning of the last century up until today. And then you can chart uh, global temperatures or temperature anomalies. And you can see through the change of the color, you can see the exponential change. You can see something that's not, that doesn't go like this, but something that goes like this. It goes exponentially up. So the change is exponential, and uh, it also is a you know aesthetically very pleasing chart. Something that's you know you can print it, you can put it in a frame, you can put it you know uh, just uh, in your in your living room as an art piece. So this is something we're going to talk more about tomorrow. We're going to talk more about the connection between art and data visualization, and all these creative ways you can visualize data via animated films visual art, uh, performances, sculptures, like the first example with the solar system was an example of a data sculpture. So we're going to talk about these more creative ways of data visualization tomorrow. And this is going to be just an introduction. I want to show you an array of examples to inspire you, to show you what is possible and what is something you can make. This is also a, a chart you can make without any kind of serious technical skills, of course, if you know coding, you can make a little program that, that generates this, but even without coding uh, knowledge, you can do it manually, you know, you just have 100 rectangles and you just uh, color one rectangle one by one and create something like this. So it's not really hard to create something like this. And you don't need to talk about temperatures, you can talk about social inequality, for example, or talk about inflation or talk about something that is, I don't know, in line with your personal interests. Something I would like to see in Belgrade, also in other cities, this is a uh, New York City street tree map. And also, it's a beautiful example of something called citizen science, or crowdfunded data. As you can see, it's a city map, and every tree in every street was actually being mapped and shown, and the size of this little bubble is relative to the size of the tree or to the, to the uh, longevity of the tree, how old the tree is, and you have different kinds of trees, so it's also something like an encyclopedia, and if you're a tree lover, as I am, this could be a really exciting way to engage people with their local environment. It's not really activist in a direct sense, that it's, I don't know, asking for people to change something directly, but it's building some kind of a deeper consciousness about the interconnectedness of humans, the nature, something we all share in our, in our environment, and that the city is not only us and our interests, and, you know, the shit we produce, it's also, you know, plants and rats and uh, streets and uh, the, 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 the air and all these microorganisms and all these, you know, huge... Uh, uh, climate factors and, uh, and uh, clouds and uh, we are all part of this ecosystem so yeah this kind of a wider consciousness is something that can be fostered with these maps and it can also be gamified like uh, young people could go from a tree to a tree and some particular trees could have some stories and they would have to come to a tree to unlock a story and then the story could bring them to another tree so you can invent an entire like a geo, a geo game that could be built upon this. It's also a really good way to motivate citizens. You don't need to have a lot of citizens. I guess a majority of people are not interested in trees and plants as much as I am, and that is completely okay. But probably you can have a minority, several people, or even I mean, 100 people who are really interested in this, and they have an app, and they go through a street, they you know record a tree, they take a photo, they you know, fill in a really simple form and then you can collect all this data within a single database and then create a visualization like this, which can be interactive, work in a browser, work in an app. And this is what we call citizen science, in a sense that's something that's been done by citizens, by everybody, something that's been like a collectively created database. So data visualization is not only about the aesthetic part, but also about the database creation part. 
And a uh, similar thing was done with these pollution uh, apps in Belgrade, where citizens were asked to actually some contribute to the, to the database of, uh, of pollution spots and how to measure pollution in Belgrade. So it can be something that can motivate people to work together and not to be at the same time especially hard to use if you make a usable usable app. Yes, and then you can you know find some specific tree such as in Kobiloba that is positioned over there. You can add some stories. You can add whatever you like. And I don't even think that it would be too expensive to make for Budapest. New York City trees by species, also a map of trees, but uh, built by a different group, and you can filter it by species uh, and see, you know, you have uh, oak trees in one part of the city, in another part of the city you have, uh, I don't know, ginkgo trees or the, uh, or the birch trees or whatever. And now a very similar map, not about trees, but about housing and about uh, real estate, about houses and other buildings, how old they are. So this is the chart of how old these uh, neighborhoods and these buildings in these neighborhoods are in Amsterdam, in Netherlands. The green ones are the youngest ones, as far as I can say. So the green ones are 2020, blue ones are uh, 2015, uh, 20, uh, 1975, and then when we go to these uh, yellow ones, these are like mid-century buildings, and the, the reddish ones are uh, something that's uh, like 1900, and the, the darker it gets, the older these houses are. So you can pretty much chart the entire city with this kind of map so people can actually see the development of the city. And this is a 3D map, it's pretty well made. Uh, if you are not versed with this kind of 3D maps, you don't have to go into you know, 3D modeling or Blender or whatever. You can make a standard 2D map, maybe maybe with OpenStreetMaps. So don't be afraid of the technological complexity of these examples. You can always make it technologically more simple, but as communicative as this one is. Uh, but what was interesting to me is that we can use this kind of uh, presentation not only to talk about how these buildings are, uh, how old these buildings are, but also talk about how affordable these buildings are in terms of housing. So we can actually visualize the gentrification process. We can visualize the process of certain parts of the city becoming much less affordable. Uh, I guess uh, this is uh, something happening in Budapest. It's also happening in Belgrade. Most of our problems are common problems. You have uh, massive uh, pricing out uh, of people in, in, in Belgrade in the center, in the wider city center, apartments are becoming much more expensive, people have to leave, have to go out. So this is something that's a really, really pressing issue, but uh, there is not much talk about that because it's uh, relatively invisible, because of the you know, deep-seated uh, interests of uh, renters, not to talk about that. Uh, because uh, it's uh, something, of course, uh, you know, politically hard to talk about, but it's also because it's invisible. Because we don't have these kind of tools that could be rhetorically powerful to talk about these kinds of problems. So this kind of map, but not about uh, how old buildings are, but how affordable the housing in these buildings is. This is something I would like to see. And these are some examples about the affordability of, of buying a flat or renting a flat. Uh, I've chosen these examples because this is what Attila and Chandra told me it might be interesting to you. So you can actually see uh, the house price forecast in these different countries. It turns out Ireland is the worst, Italy here is the best, and uh, the final year is, is the projection of what's going to happen. So this is a chart made in 2019, in, in 2020. 2020 was the future of this chart. But whatever the time frame is, you can actually see, uh, you can actually see how, what are, what are the trends, and the trends are that it's mostly rising house prices are mostly rising and they would probably be exponentially higher in 2023. 
This is a really nice, a really nice website made in Berlin about uh, housing in Berlin. It's called Alle müssen wohnen. Everybody needs to live somewhere. Uh, and uh, it's a, uh, also an example of a combination between web design and data visualization. How can you use data visualization in combination with interactive design to make an interactive experience that could be engaging and informative? And this is the map of Berlin. And you can uh, use controls. Above, you can see the price and you can see the number of rooms. And I could say that I have, I don't know, 1,000 euros to spend for an apartment and I need, I know, one or two rooms and then I would get a map where in Berlin would such a flat with such a price and with such configurations be available. So, so, so the, this thing becomes visible. And also you can add a timeline, and then with the timeline you can see how does it change over time, and you can see certain parts like Kreuzberg becoming you know, gentrified, something that was really available and livable 20 years ago, it's not livable right now, and so on and so on. Another website that's interactive and it's really a good combination of storytelling, like a journalistic storytelling and web design, uh, it's published by Huffington Post, it shows a story about millennials and how housing has become unavailable to millennials. Understanding structural disadvantage, when you go to the website, you scroll the website, and as you scroll the website, you get all these beautiful, really, really beautiful visuals together with a story explaining, explaining the problem. So this is like a regular website that works as a form of parallax scrolling. The only thing you do is you scroll, but as you scroll, uh, you don't only get the text scrolling, you get all the visuals together with the text also, uh, also become activated. So like an interactive story. And if you're more interested in this, we can open it later and you know, check it out together to see all the uh, all the particularities. I really I like this, this um, subtitle, the class of oh no. The millennials are the class of oh no. And you have these funny elements when they talk to boomers and boomers don't understand them. Boomers just say, yeah, you should work harder then you can afford a house. But how can I afford a house? That's three Miladin Kovacevic. <laughs> I don't have a three Miladin Kovacevic in my pocket to give me three Miladin Kovacevic and I will buy a house. <laughs> oh, okay, boomer. Yeah. It's a really, really simple design. Uh, well animated, but in a minimalist way with this pixel art aesthetics. It's also something that can be transferred into a relatively simple video game built in Godot or in Unity. Maybe you have somebody who's, who's into these things. It doesn't have to be, you know, like a fully functional commercial video game, but maybe it can be like a simple one level web browser based uh, game that could function more as a viral uh, story than as a real game, but it could, you know, illustrate certain problems that, that people in Budapest have. Rest in peace, my chances of affording a home. And then also, this is a uh, this is a story about um, about suburbia and about this particular way of building American cities and how it created the problem with the, with the housing that we have today. So they explain all the structural issues, not only. Uh, they are not only uh, like uh, talking about how big the problem is, but they try to explain the mechanism, how we got here and what are the possible alternatives, what to do now when we are in this, when I'm in this situation. Another visualization that can also be relatively easy to make is the rental listings. This is Craigslist rental listings where the uh, where the flats are most expensive and you have a problem with this kind of maps because they always look also something like population maps. 
like the mo most people live in California and in New York, New York and these big cities, and then of course, you know, the most of the econ economic activities over there, and then you have the most uh, expensive housing over there. So yeah, you should always be careful about these things. This is a very smart data visualization. It's not especially funny and creative in a, uh, in a visual way, but in a methodological way it is really creative. It shows the number of years a skilled worker needs to work to, to be able to buy a 60 square meter big, uh, big uh, flat near the city center. So it doesn't express uh, the, the price in terms of dollars or euros or Miladin Kovacevic, it uh, expresses the price in terms of how many years you need to work as a skilled worker. And of course, you can also divide it in different industries. If you're in the IT industry, it would be less years than if you're, I don't know, in, in the baking industry or you're just uh, somebody who works as a physical laborer. But uh, anyway, uh, you can create some kind of, you know, worker classes and then according to that uh, you can show how many years do I need to work to be able to buy a house and the Hong Kong proves to be the most terrible, London is also pretty terrible and so on and so on. And keep in mind this is something made a couple of years ago, today it would probably be much worse than it was back then. But it, you know, also uh, the, the way we express real estate in terms of years of work makes it much, much more graspable, makes it something we can actually feel. Okay, so I need to spend, I know, 15 years of my miserable life to be able to afford something like that. So it make, makes you actually think about, about these things. So 15 years, if I have a kid, if, you know, my partner and I have a kid today, in 15 years, this kid's going to be in, in high school and so on and so on. It makes people actually connect the data with their real life, with their real experience, with something that actually matters to them. And this is uh, like, like the holy grail of data visualization to make things that are honest, that are mathematically precise, scientifically accurate, but at the same time emotionally powerful, at the same time something that people can actually relate to as much as they would relate to, I know, a short story or a film or visual art or a web comic or something like that. Uh, yeah, another creative examples I want to show you today. This is something we already talked about. This is a sentence from an interview by Adam Curtis. He's a British filmmaker, an author of this great film such as The Century of the Self and all watched over by machines of loving grace. I, I love his work and here he talks about how the systems of power of today are fundamentally invisible to us. Uh, it resides in finance, in all sorts of new kinds of management and within computers and the media which involve invisible algorithms that shape and manage what information we get. I think what's waiting to be invented is new kind of imaginative language that describes the world of power. So this is the key, new imaginative language that describes the world of power, which is invisible to us and I think both journalism and art can do this because the present languages are so boring and so obscure and so dull that people turn away from them. And if you look at how people talk about data in regular journalism, be it digital or analog or on television, it's mostly uh, boring and obscure and dull and it is like, you know, politicians talking about billions of euros. Nobody knows what these billions of euros mean. Even Activists, even people who are well-intended, who want to have some kind of social change, when they talk about these numbers, they sound dull and obscure and abstract, and people are not able to relate to that. So this new language Adam Curtis is talking about, he thinks about his, uh, you know, creative documentary filmmaking, but I, I would say that data visualization can also do that. And with some kind of imaginative data visualization, we can strive to create these new languages for describing various systems in which we live, especially these, these worlds of power that is today much more obscure than, than it used to be. One example of the visualization of a power structure is this beautiful chart that looks like a, 
like a ball clay drawing of a young plant, young wine, something like that, but actually it's not that. This is actually an organizational chart. It was drawn at the end of 19th century and it shows uh, and it shows, uh, shows the organizational structure of a railway company in the United States. So you have a railway company, and then you have the CEO, like the Jeff Bezos of the railway company, and then you have all the members of the, of the board of directors, uh, and then you have regional managers, and these lines are the actual railroad lines that go all the way from New York to Philadelphia to Washington to Baltimore, to other cities in the States. And each dot here actually represents a railway station, and this railway station has a bunch of, you know, uh, its own middle managers and then workers working at that station. So this is how it looks like when we zoom it in a little bit. We have New York, Jersey City, and then some other cities over there, and then, you know, from a Jersey City, you have this little plant-like structure that actually describes the organizational structure of that place. And why am I showing you this? Because this is an example of a hierarchical data visualization, hierarchical structures. How do we visualize hierarchical structures? Hierarchical structures could, are basically everywhere. We can talk about, uh, you know, family tree diagrams. Family trees are also hierarchical structures, but uh, when we talk about Carl Linné, uh, like the tree of life, biological, zoological way of classifying things, it's also hierarchical visualization. Files on your computer can be also visualized in a hierarchical way. You have the root directory, then you have directories within the root directory and all the other directories, and then you can create a chart that's really similar to this one. So when you start to think in structural terms, you can see that there are just so many similarities between different types of data sets, and it becomes much easier to talk about, about phenomena, especially about this kind of deep-rooted structural power. Because if we go back to history, and this is basically the structure of the Roman Empire. And then the Roman Empire imposed this kind of structure to its military. Later, we got the companies. Corporations have the same structure, our national states have the same structure, you know, global big data conglomerates have a very similar structure, and although you know, the pioneers of internet dreamt about this horizontal connection between all the people in the world and how internet is going to be this techno-utopian dream of horizontally connecting people beyond these hierarchical power structures actually turned out to be otherwise turned out to be uh, the internet proved to be this major, you know, engine of centralizing power, something like gravity being centralized around the sun and all the other, you know, planets having its own satellites and so on and so on. And although today's uh, neoliberal world seems really liberal, it turns out that neoliberalism is actually extremely autocratic in terms of these power structures that it creates. It's just that they are much more obscure than they used to be. So, okay, we have Vucic, we have Viktor Orban, and we have some people who are in power and we can see them, but beyond that, they are just the exponents of this really, really complex network of media and algorithms and capital and financial interests and all being globally interconnected. And when Adam Curtis talks about this new language of representing these things, I think that data visualization is kind of alternative cartography or counter cartography that could come from us can be really, really beneficial in a sense of, of showing people like what are the what is the world that they're living in, you know, from pollution to housing unavailability to climate change to you know uh, to being able to actually feel and imagine things as the solar system. So data visualization always has this tense relationship between aesthetics and structure. Something can be really beautiful at the same time such as this poster, but can be uh, can also talk about a thing that can be problematic and scary in another way. Just as uh, another piece of art again. Because in the end I find just the aesthetics of this extremely exciting and beautiful. I would print it, you know, and put it in my living room. And this is another 
example of these data visualizations that are really beautiful and artistically poignant and they talk about tragic, you know, historical things and events. This time we talk about Atlantic slave trade and this was a chart uh, drawn by a British uh, company that makes ships. It was built, I think, in the 18th century, something like that, 17th or 18th century. And they were like a classic private company. They produced ships and the uh, people who transport slaves from Africa to the Americans, they would buy these ships. And so they, as a ship owning company, wanted to show how many slaves you can actually put in a ship. So they drew these tiny little bodies inside these ships. When you zoom in, you can actually see each one of these bodies in a ship. And uh, so this is the way they could communicate that their company is able to build a ship in which you can put exactly, I think, 421 people in a ship. And for me, it was such a poignant art piece, also not only an information piece, because each one of these people were drawn by hand, and each one of these people were drawn, you know, in an analog fashion, and is different, and I could go from a face to face, and actually, you know, imagine their emotions, trying to imagine their life stories, trying to imagine how they felt. It actually made me uh, capable of imagining the horror of this historical, historical event that otherwise would only seem like a statistics to me. Because this is also a great danger of data visualization is to reduce people to numbers. And a way to fight that is to add some kind of a human touch, some kind of a glitch. In this case, you could add something that is hand-drawn, something that's not completely precise. You don't have like perfect dots here. You have things that has been, have been drawn by hand, and although they're completely mathematically precise uh, how many people could fit into a boat, at the same time, each one of these people is a, is a human being, is a different being, you can imagine them. And when the abolitionist movement came in the 19th century, they used these kind of visuals in a British parliament to advocate for the abolitionist policies, for the, uh, you know, confronting the past of slavery and colonialism, trying to ban that. So they were using these posters that were, that were once part of the completely official and legal commercial capitalist activity, they use these kind of posters as a way to try to confront that. So these posters became a, became a tool for political change that were once only these regular commercial posters because they were so emotionally poignant. And also this is an example of a data visualization you don't even need a computer to build because this has been drawn by hand. All these, all these charts were back then drawn by hand and designed by hand. Behold the two, the one uh, really, really interesting art and design collective from Paris that I like a lot, said this data aesthetics is to the government by information systems, what the portrait of king, kings was to the monarchy. So the visualization of power, in other words. And for the end of this section, I want to show you the map of Yugoslav anti-fascists liberating the city of Belgrade at the end of World War II. Balkan partisans are red and Nazis are blue and this was the way uh, the fighting has been done in Belgrade at the end of the Second World War. And the way of defeating Nazis was the way of you know, building quality organizational, organizational systems but also having, you know, both guns and poetry and ways of combining organizational systems with poetry with visuals such as this one to make maps as poignant as poems would be. This is how the Nazis were defeated once. So if we defeated them once, maybe we can do it again. And for the very end, I want to say something about uh, particular data visualization tools. We're going to talk more about that tomorrow. But before we go to the data visualization tools, if you, have, if you have some questions about these examples, about the topic, you are free to, to intervene. Okay, we can do it later. Data visualization tools.
to sit down now because this is a little bit more practical. I'm going to start with uh, this technolo technology heavy D3 uh, library. It's something made for coders and programmers. And uh, as far as I understood, there are not many of, of uh, software engineers here today. So this is probably not going to be useful to you, but if you in your team have somebody who's proficient in JavaScript and HTML, they can use this to build interactive pieces, such as the ones, so some of the examples that I've shown you today. Also, the Observable website has a beautiful collection of databases. All this has been powered by Mike Bostock. He's been the, the brain behind the D3 library and behind the Observable website. He used to work as a chief data visualization specialist in the New York Times, and then he, uh, he uh, quit the job a couple of years ago and started with, uh, started with this Observable project. Also Tableau, Tableau is the most corporate of all of these tools. It's mainly used in the industry. It's used a lot. Uh, I guess it's very useful within this, within this setting. And there's also something called Tableau Public, and with the Tableau Public you can uh, get for free a lot of the functionalities that the official Tableau has. I never used it that much, but I know that some people use it a lot, and they say good things about it. So, I mean, it's okay to mention it among other tools. Google Spreadsheets can also be really useful, so don't discard these tools that may seem too basic and uh, uh, not really you know, full of functionalities and so on. Some charts that you can make with Google Spreadsheets are just completely okay. And sometimes this is probably the best way to go because it's the easiest way to go. Uh, if you ask me, is Excel the same? I would say no, Excel is terrible. Never use Excel. Excel just should disappear from the face of the earth. Together with Microsoft Word, together with PowerPoint. These things should just, they should just disappear. They existed for a while, it's okay, but now it should come to an end. Data Studio also, for these uh, like fancy corporate uh, dashboards and stuff, Google Ads and stuff. This is also something developers could use. I found raw graphs really refreshing and uh, a really good way to, to build the data visualizations that are a little bit more complex than basic charts, but also don't require any kind of coding skills. So if you don't have coding skills, but you want to build charts that look like this, like a Voronoi tessellations, hexagonal binding and stuff that are a little bit more, let's say, uh, sophisticated and things that you could be build with Google Spreadsheets, row graphs is, is one way to do that. And I would play with row graphs. If we have time tomorrow, I will show you how, how row graphs work. Uh, it's also open source. You can uh, code, use it uh, in terms of coding if you know how to do it, but you don't have to. You can use it as a regular user. Open Refine, another useful tool. And Canva and Flourish is something that I found that my students use the most, and they're really satisfied with Flourish, and Flourish is something that I'm definitely going to show you tomorrow. How many of you have used Canva before? So a lot of you, yeah. So I think Canva is quite idiot proof in a sense that it's really easy to use and Flourish now became like, like a, an add-on to Canva, and in Flourish you can generate animated charts, you can generate interactive charts, you can make things that you can then incorporate into Canva presentations. It's also an exciting way to go, to have a presentation type thing, like a slideshow presentation, but not with the PowerPoint, but with, the, with these kind of tools where you would get animated charts together with the story. And if you're giving a presentation, and maybe tomorrow we will end with a workshop where your task would be to create a small data story, you would end this data story with a small presentation. So we will definitely going to talk more about Flourish. I found it more useful than, than other tools in terms of these really quick, everyday type of database presentations that you can build. 
Uh, you have also Graph Commons, it's made by some Turkish company, it's for building this kind of social graphs, ones Hannah Arendt was talking about, and uh, they are also animated, they are also interactive, and they don't require any kind of coding skills. They want to, I don't know, to show how different uh, parts of society are connected, financial interest companies, who owns companies, and then you have these individuals who own these companies, and so on, and so on. It's a good way to do that. And this is this particular map shows that you have Istanbul, you have some other parts of Turkey, and you have different companies in Turkey, and they wanted to chart like the Turkish ruling class through this kind of through this kind of diagrams. Pictochart can be useful, no, mostly for these kind of lightweight infographics that are not data heavy that are more like stories, they have a lot of these pictographic elements, little icons, little kind of diagrams, illustrations, and it has a lot of templates. It's kind of kitschy, I don't really like a lot of this stuff, but uh, some students find it really useful, and it's also something that is really easy to use, so maybe sometimes it would do the job. If you don't have more design skills, if you don't have enough time, if you don't have, I don't know, enough uh, will to, to develop deeper into the making of a database, Pictochart can help you build something really fast. Sometimes that is, that is the most important parameter. Color Brewer, a really good tool for choosing colors for your data visualization because it's a huge topic, how to choose the right colors. We can talk about colors for several days, how to choose colors that are good for photocopies, for printing, how to choose colors for people who are colorblind, how to choose colors in terms of cultural sensitivities. You know, the color red is not the same in, in the United States or in Russia or in India. In each place, you know, the color red has a completely different symbolism. And it can become really politically problematic which color you use in different kind of settings. I remember there was a huge uh, discussion in the States about police shootings, whether this police shooting is going to be shown in red, like circles in red on a map, or circles in blue. And then you had the left wing wanted them to be red, and the right wing wanted them to be blue. Blue because blue lives matter, because you know the blue is the color of the law and order, and the red is the color of blood and the color of violence, and then you got all the mythological differences, you know, between worldviews and good and evil and stuff like that, just because of something that you would imagine is like a random design choice, like it can be blue or it can be red. But no, it can go really, really deep, and the psychology of color is really complex, and uh, and it's definitely something that you that you wouldn't underestimate. Uh, building interactive timelines with timeline JS. Uh, I guess in Canva and Flourish you can now do it even better than in timeline JS. But okay, you still have timeline JS. Uh, 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 you don't need to know any coding also for Timeline.js, all you need to do is to prepare a, spare, a spreadsheet in Google Sheets and then just give a link to the Timeline.js and if, if it's done properly, Timeline.js would automatically create an interactive timeline out of the spreadsheets that it has been provided with. And these are some of the examples of my website some of the workshops I gave, some of the tools I made, and uh, these are some of the more creative pieces that I'm going to talk about tomorrow, to show you some animations, to show you some gallery work, to show you some other uh, database and data art and data storytelling pieces. Uh, but we're going to talk more about that tomorrow. So for today, I just wanted to open the topic to show you how big it is, to show you how creative it is, how transdisciplinary it is, how it can be politically relevant, how it can be, you know, artistically poignant, how fun can it be, uh, and how you can take the most boring thing in the world, which is statistics, and turn it into, like, the most exciting thing in the world, which is, you know, art and storytelling. Well, thank you.